John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Welcome to War of the Rebellion Stories of the Civil War. I am your host, Leon Meowser, and this is a reading of the regimental history. Under the Maltese Crass, Antietam to Appomattox, The Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861 to 1865, Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the Rank and File. Chapter 15 Hatcher's Run. Weldon Railroad Raid Confederate General Hampton's Cavalry Raid in Rear of Union Army Pickets in front of 155th attacked by enemy Cavalry Reconnaissance in Direction of Southside Railroad Regiment Supports Cavalry on Squirrel Level Road Engagement at Chapman's Farm Battle of Peeble Farm Capture of Fort McRae by Griffin's Division 155th Colors First Planted on Enemy's Works Farewell Sermon of Chaplain J.M. Mateer Orders to Pack Up and Break Camp Enemy Encountered in Strong Force at Hatcher's Run Fifth Corps regains its former quarters. Sutler Stores Weldon Railroad Raid Destruction of Track Contrabands Bushwhackers and Guerrilla Foraging Applejack and Peach Brandy Sussex Courthouse Burned Regiment goes into winter quarters. Griffin's division on march to left. Engagement at Dabney's Mills. Engagement of Second Hatcher's Run. Lieutenant Colonel Ewing wounded. Casualties. Successful cattle raid by Hampton's Cavalry. Very early, on the morning of the 15th of September, 1864, General Grant received reports from the Union Cavalry outpost that a mysterious movement of Confederate cavalry was taking place on the left of the Fifth Corps. A reconnoitering force, composed of several regiments of Union cavalry and a brigade of infantry, was sent out towards the Volgan Road, running nearly south from Petersburg. The enemy's outpost lines were broken through, and the country traversed in various directions, and although Deering's Confederate cavalry was encountered, and a slight brush took place, the reconnaissance could obtain no knowledge of anything alarming. Yet one of the most brilliant, daring, and successful raids of the war was being made by the Confederate cavalry leader, General Wade Hampton. Setting out from Reen Station on the Weldon Railroad, and making a wide detour of the Union left, General Hampton, with his Confederate cavalry and two batteries, appeared suddenly early on the morning of the 16th of September, 1864, in the rear of the center of the Army of the Potomac. One of Hampton's regiments, dressed in Union cavalry uniforms, relieved the Union pickets, thus making the surprise more complete. His object was to seize a herd of 2,500 beef cattle pasturing southeast of Petersburg, near Sycamore Church. The attack was so sudden and the surprise so complete that Spears' Union Cavalry Brigade, which was picketing the locality, was driven away by the Confederates, and two regiments, the 13th Pennsylvania and the 1st District of Columbia Cavalry, stampeded the latter regiment with all its horses, arms, equipments, wagons, and camp paraphernalia being captured. It is also related that General Grant and his staff, whose headquarters were close by, narrowly escaped being among the trophies of the daring Confederate cavalry leader. 
As soon as this great herd of cattle, with their herdsmen, guards, etc., were secured and driven ahead, General Hampton and his troopers set out on their return to the Confederate lines. General Cotts and Gregg's Union Cavalry Divisions soon followed in rapid pursuit, continuing as far as Belcher's Mill on the Jerusalem Plank Road, where the Confederates, under Rosser and Deering, made a stand, holding the Union Cavalry at bay while the other portions of Hampton's columns moved leisurely off with the cattle. In addition to the cattle herd, Hampton carried off 300 prisoners, 200 mules, and 32 wagons, also a telegraphic construction corps of 40 men, with their trains and 20 miles of wire. Attack on Union Picket Line The more effectively to conceal his raid of Hampton's cavalry, the Confederates, early on the morning of the 16th of September, made a fierce attack upon the pickets all along the line of the Fifth Corps, driving many of them into the entrenchments. The attack in front of the 155th continued for more than an hour, but the Union pickets succeeded in repulsing the enemy. When the firing began on the picket line, the 155th was called to arms, and the company stacked their muskets in the company streets to await the result of the attack upon the pickets. While the regiment was thus marshaled, a large black snake was seen protruding its head and neck from a hollow limb of a large oak tree in the camp, and a member of Company H, with an axe, climbed the tree to cut off the limb. Sitting astride, the limb, with his back against the trunk of the tree, the soldier attempted to sever the limb between himself and the hole in which the snake was concealed. The strokes of the axe, jarring the limb, caused the snake to poke his head out of the hole in attempt to escape. The axeman, using the handle of his axe as a club, battled with the reptile to drive it into the hole again. This unique battle was kept up half an hour before the limb was finally severed from the tree and the serpent dispatched. During the progress of this snake fight, more interest was displayed in it by the 155th than in the expected attack of the enemy. Engagement at Chapin's Farm On the 29th of September, 1864, a reconnaissance was made by Gregg's cavalry towards the left front of Griffin's division in the direction of the South Side Railroad. In the afternoon of that day, it was evident, from the heavy cannonading in that direction, that the Union cavalry had come into contact with the enemy in force. In the meantime, the 155th having received orders to pack up, moved about five o'clock p.m., a short distance on the Squirrel Level Road. Then, turning to the right on a narrow country road, advanced a mile, where it formed in line of battle to support the cavalry. The latter fell back through the lines of the 155th, pursued by the enemy. After a slight skirmish, the Confederates finding that they were fighting with infantry fell back. The regiment remained in position until darkness set in, then marched back to its old camp. The skirmish was known as the Battle of Chapin's Farm. The Action at Peebles Farm Early on the morning of the 30th of September, Griffin's division returned to its position of the evening before, and with cavalry skirmishers in front, advanced about a mile. At this point, the enemy's skirmish line proving too strong for the cavalry, Griffin's infantry division formed in line of battle, and, advancing slowly, pressed the enemy's skirmish line in a northwesterly direction. The Confederate artillery, supporting their skirmish line, seemed to have a good range as to distance, but their shells burst high in the air, doing but little damage. As Griffin's division descended into a deep, heavily wooded ravine, the enemy's shells cut down trees eight to ten inches thick, in the vicinity of the 155th. Several short halts were made in this ravine to straighten the alignment of the advancing columns. After crossing a small stream at the bottom of the ravine, Griffin's division threw out a strong line of skirmishers and awaited developments. The skirmishers met with little resistance, advanced up to the crest of the ridge on the opposite side of the valley until reaching the open space beyond the crest where they were met by a furious enfilading fire 
from an unseen foe lurking in the woods on the left front. The 155th skirmishers were well protected by large oak trees, and the Confederate skirmishers, while making very close shots, failed to repulse them. This cleared space, known as People's Farm, was of several hundred acres in extent and entirely enclosed by a fringe of forest on four sides. The ground descended slightly from the edge of the woods, in which the Union troops were located, to the middle of the plantation occupied by the homestead, barn and numerous outbuildings, then gradually ascended to the farther side of the farm. On commanding ridges on the opposite side of these fields, half a mile distant, was discovered a Confederate redoubt called Fort McRae, containing several rifled guns, and connecting on either side with lines of well-constructed entrenchments erected by Confederates, having a clear sweep of the entire open ground of this farm. Across the space, a thousand yards wide, Griffin's division was to charge on the enemy's works. Capture of Fort McRae As the 155th line of battle advanced to and joined the skirmishers on the edge of the plantation, the fire from the enemy's position became furious. For some reason, the regiment advanced on the charge before orders to do so were given. As the troops, with loud cheers, started on the double-quick into the open ground, Colonel A. L. Pearson, commanding the 155th, who had dismounted, shouted to the men to halt. Finding he could not make himself heard, the colonel, with an oath, exclaimed, quote, Well, if you will go, then go, unquote. and starting after, he was soon in the midst of the charging column. This assault of Griffin's division on Fort McRae and the enemy's breastworks was to have been made in three lines, one behind another. But if the charge was so made, the lines soon became intermingled as one line. Color Sergeant Thomas J. Marlin of the 155th, seeing that the color bearer of another regiment of Griffin's division was likely to reach the Confederate works sooner than he, called on Corporal Thomas Anderson of Company I to assist him, and the two planted the colors of the 155th on the enemy's works ahead of all the other regiments of Griffin's division. When the charging column had approached to within 100 yards of the enemy's entrenchments, the cannoneers in Fort McRae were seen limbering up their guns and hooking on their horses, and when the Union troops surged up over the breastworks like a huge, resistless billow, the Confederates had made good their escape leaving but one gun and fifty or sixty prisoners in the hands of Griffin's victorious troops. A half hour later, Potter's division of the Ninth Corps marched through the captured works in pursuit of the retreating enemy. An hour later, heavy musketry and cannonading in the direction taken by the Ninth Corps announced the fact that they had overtaken the foe. But as the tumult became louder and nearer, it also became evident that the Confederates were the victors. Shortly after the advance of the Ninth Corps in pursuit of the enemy and their apparent repulse, the 155th, which was with the 3rd Brigade, had been massed near the spot where they had crossed the enemy's works. With Colonel Pearson leading, double-quicked to the left a short distance, with the enemy's bullets humming over their heads and through their ranks, the regiment then charged through the woods to a field beyond, encountering the enemy flushed with victory, advancing to recapture their lost works. It appears that after passing through the captured works and advancing some distance, Potter's division of the Ninth Corps formed in line of battle and advanced until checked by the enemy in a strong line of works on a hill half a mile further on. Endeavoring to carry this position, the Ninth Corps division suffered a severe repulse and being thrown into confusion allowed a gap in their lines to be created, through which the Confederates threw a strong flanking force, dispersing Potter's division and capturing more than 1,500 prisoners. Sweeping onward, this flanking force of the enemy endeavored to recapture their lost works of Peebles Farm, and it was this force that the 155th, as already described under Colonel Pearson, encountered and drove back. The other troops of Griffin's division, with a battery, soon came to the sport of the 155th, and a hot engagement ensued, lasting until darkness put an end to the strife. For more than an hour during this engagement, the 155th lay on the ground loading and firing, 
directly in front of the guns of Griffin's battery, which fired over the heads of the prostate regiment, a position which finally became exceedingly uncomfortable. When this battery became engaged in a duel with a Confederate battery, which had got the range. When night came on and the firing ceased, the 155th, using their bayonets and tin plates, threw up light entrenchments of earth. The next day, the artillery firing on both sides was kept up all day, with few casualties in the regiment. Entrenching Operations Renewed On October 1st, 1864, the 155th moved nearly a mile to the right along the captured works and began the work of changing them into Union defenses. On the 2nd of October, because of some threatening movements of the enemy, the regiment was moved back to the position which it had occupied on the afternoon and the evening of the 30th of September. Beyond a severe shelling by the enemy, only skirmish firing took place. In the afternoon of the 2nd, the regiment again moved to the right, taking a position nearly half a mile in advance of the enemy's works captured on the 30th, and for several days labored hard in the construction of new defenses, with plenty of slashed timber in front. On October 7, 1864, a recruit of Company H, who had been with the regiment only five days, becoming demoralized with fear when assigned to picket duty, committed suicide by shooting himself through the head while on his post forty or fifty rods in advance of the breastworks. On October 8, 1864, the picket line of the 155th was advanced half a mile, the regiment in line of battle supporting the movement. From the 8th to the 26th of October, 1864, no event of unusual importance occurred to the 155th. Comfortable quarters had been erected, and the men daily performed the common routine duties of camp, such as guard mount, inspections, sending out details to build new fortifications, strengthen old ones, etc. On October 23rd, 1864, the regimental chaplain, Rev. J. M. Mateer, D.D., preached his farewell sermon to the regiment. General Gregory, of the 91st Pennsylvania, who had a few days previous been promoted to a brigadier generalship, taking an active part in the services. Chaplain Mateer's resignation was greatly regretted by the 155th. His Christian character was fully exemplified by his frequent visits and ministrations to the sick and wounded of the regiment in the field hospitals. In the camp, Many a soldier's pathway was made smoother by the kindly advice of this simple-hearted, Christian minister, who sought only to do the master's will. Frequently, before battles, Chaplain Mateer became the repository of the money, valuables, mementos, and letters of members of the 155th, to be sent, in the event of their falling in battle, to relations and friends in the distant north. The trust thus reposed in him was always faithfully executed, and the burden of many a grief was lightened by the comforting words accompanying these messages. As the season of the year in Virginia, the fields and lanes contained an abundance of persimmon trees, the fruits of which was now ripe, and the forests a plentiful crop of wild fox grapes, of moderate size and good flavor, but the men of the 155th not being permitted, either by their officers or by the enemy to roam the country at will, were compelled to forego the forbidden fruit. The outlying pickets were more fortunate in this respect, as they occasionally gathered quantities of delicious fruit. Action at Hatcher's Run On the 26th of October, 1864, orders to pack up and break camp were received and at an early hour on the 27th of October, 1864, the regiment commanded by Colonel A. L. Pearson marched out of their works near Peebles Farm, and with the other regiments of the 2nd Brigade, took its place in the columns of Griffin's division. To attempt, by another flank movement, to get a grip on the South Side Railroad. Soon after passing through the Union picket line, the enemy's outposts were reached and their pickets driven two or three miles into their first line of works. Here the Confederates were encountered in strong force. The 155th doubtless were ready to renew the attempt to rout them, had the regiments been ordered to charge on the works. 
Indeed, several of the most adventurous spirits of the regiment did advance, too, and mounted to the top of the enemy's defenses, and nearly escaped being killed or captured for their rashness. Corporal George Cleaver, with some comrades of Company K, approached the hostile works without being discovered. The corporal mounting to the top of the parapet, the enemy, not expecting an attack, had been paying but little attention to their front, and when Cleaver appeared upon the parapet, they were very much surprised, a Confederate officer exclaiming, quote, Look at that damned Yankee! Shoot him! Shoot him! Unquote. Causing the corporal to make a hasty retreat, finding that probably no attempt would be made to assault the Confederate line, the 155th threw up light earthworks, which they occupied, continuously until noon of the 18th of October, being under a desultory fire from the enemy the entire time. At this point on Hatcher's run, the 5th Corps was formed in three lines of battle, Griffin's division being on the second line. During the period of the enemy's hottest fire, a New York regiment of fresh troops in the first line of battle, becoming panic-stricken on the opening of the battle, made a rush through the 155th for the rear, many throwing away in their flight guns, accoutrements, and knapsacks. The 155th, having before the wilderness campaign relieved themselves of all superfluous baggage, joyously availed themselves of this opportunity to secure a fresh supply of overcoats and well-stocked knapsacks, which, in many cases, they refused afterwards to restore to their original owners. It was learned later that the Second Corps, which was still further to the left than the Fifth Corps, had been unable, because of the impenetrable forests and marshes, to secure a favorable position to connect with Warren's troops, and as the enemy's fortifications were being rapidly manned with strong reinforcements, an assault was deemed impractical, and the Union troops were withdrawn. The previous night had been cold and wet, causing considerable suffering among the troops, and it was with much rejoicing that the 155th, on the 28th of October, marched back to their former comfortable quarters in the entrenchments. Camp Life Incidents during the autumn just ending, the 155th, in its various movements, was never settled in a camp longer than a day until the regimental settler pitched his tent and displaying his enticing wares for sale, a plentiful supply of tobacco, both for chewing and smoking, could always be obtained from the settler's store at a very moderate price. If a youth had never been addicted to the use of tobacco at home, it required but a short period after enlistment for him to acquire a taste for the weed. The articles of food kept in stock by the sutler was a decided variance from Uncle Sam's fare, and had it not been for high prices and a lack of money, the soldiers might have enjoyed many home luxuries. Butter was in greatest demand as a luxury to be used on the good soft bread rations issued by the government to the troops when in camp, and eighty cents to a dollar a pound was not considered a high price for it as being of a much stronger quality than the home article, a much smaller quantity of it sufficed. About the 1st of November, 1864, the 155th was transferred to the 3rd Brigade of the 1st Division of the 5th Corps with Brigadier General Joseph J. Bartlett, a brave and popular officer, as commander of the brigade. Life in the trenches, camps and marches, drills and inspections continued daily during this month, Along in the first days of December, 1864, the hopes of the 155th of being ordered to go into permanent winter quarters were much disturbed by rumors of another flank movement of the 5th Corps towards the South Side Railroad. The movement of the 6th Corps to the rear of the 5th Corps seemed a confirmation of these camp rumors, and when orders were received by the regiment to pack up, no surprise was felt. In the meantime, the 155th were delighted to learn that Colonel Pearson had received a commission as Brevet Brigadier General and Lieutenant Colonel Ewing as Brevet Colonel, on recommendation of General Meade for gallant and meritorious conduct in the field. The Weldon Railroad Raid Which we will pick up next week, my friends. And, in fact, I've got a lot of notes, so let's get started. 
This is going to be a very long episode. So if you don't have time, check out now. We're at the 25 and a half minute mark. I have a lot of pictures, a lot of links, and a lot of things to read. So let's get started right into it. General Hampton stealing all that cattle really annoyed Grant. And I know that. Uh, and now it's called the Beefsteak Raid nowadays, but I first found out about it while reading Campaigning with Grant by Horace Porter, which was published in January 1897 by the Century Company. And it is a book I will cover on my Patreon at some point. It's one of my favorite books of all time about the Civil War. Anyway, here's a quote from that. Quote, During Grant's visit to Sheridan, the enemy's cavalry had made a bold dash around the left of Meade's line and captured over 2,000 head of cattle. One evening, after Grant's return, at the close of a conversation upon this subject, a citizen from Washington, who was stopping at City Point, inquired of him, When do you expect to starve out Lee and capture Richmond? Never, replied the general significantly, if our armies continue to supply him with beef cattle. <laughs> Which... I found really amusing. That's the only part that it's mentioned in the whole book, but I found that very entertaining. And so I like that it comes up at this point, uh, also in the 155th history. And also the soldier trying to kill the snake from the tree limb. I can only imagine how entertaining that was to watch in real time or the cheers that it probably elicited from the other troops. War and the military always has really silly things that happen in contrast to like the seriousness of what's going on. All right. And talking about Fort McRae and the battle of people's farm. First off, I have a sketch from Harper's weekly of this battle and the battlefield trust has a whole page on the battle and the brilliant map and a legend. And I've got, I'm going to put up a ton of pictures, guys, please come to my website at rebellionstories.com and check it out. This is going to be chocked full of stuff for you guys to look at. This way you'll be able to kind of see how this battle played out. All of these kind of different pictures and stuff. Anyway, uh, I found a website. It's a description from the Battle of People's Farm. It's from Colonel Theodore Lyman. And it's a letter that he wrote at Meade's headquarters. And I just wanted to read it to give like a general over overview everything that would happen or that was happening here at people's farm quote some time after an aide came in from general warren with news that griffin had captured a strong lined and a redoubt in handsome style not long after the general rode to the front where we arrived at 245 most of the road was through a pleasant wood chiefly oak passing the church a little old wooden building that might seat 40 persons we turned to the right and came out on a large, open farm. On a roll of land, just ahead, was the people house, pretty well riddled with bullets, and hence you looked over, more land ending in a fringe of wood. Perhaps four hundred yards in front was the captured line and the redoubt, the former very strongly and handsomely made, the latter not quite finished inside, wanting still the platforms for the guns, otherwise it was done, with a ditch outside and an abatis. So far as I can learn, the occupying force was about equal to the attacking, but they did not make as good a fight as usual. The two assaulting brigades advanced very handsomely and rushed over the works. The enemy began at once to draw off their cannon, but the horses of one piece were shot, and it fell into our hands. The loss was very small in the assault, not over one hundred, which shows how much safer it is to run boldly on. The enemy get excited and fire high. I went into the redoubt, and a rebel artilleryman lay dead on the parapet, killed so instantly by a shot through the head that the expression of his face was unchanged. In front, they were burying two or three of our men, and a corporal was marking their names on a headboard, copying from letters found in their pockets. Park was now ordered to form on the left of Warren, Ayers being on the right of Griffin. It was understood that the whole line would then advance from its present position near the P. Graham house, and see if it were practical to carry the second line, which lay perhaps three-fourths of a mile beyond. As I understand it, General Meade's orders were not properly carried out, for Griffin did not form, 
so as to make an extension of Park's line. At 5.30, we were sitting in the Peeble House, waiting for the development of the attack, when we heard very heavy musketry beyond the narrow belt of the woods that separated us from the Pegram farm. There was cheering, too, and then more musketry, and naturally we supposed that Park was assaulting. But presently, there came from the woods a considerable number of stragglers, making their way to the rear. Then came even a piece of a regiment, with its colors, and this halted inside the captured works. The musketry now drew plainly nearer, and things began to look ticklish. I watched anxiously a brigade of the Fifth Corps that stood massed in the edge of the wood, beyond the redoubt. Suddenly, it filed to the left at a double quick, the brigade colors trotting gaily at the head, then formed line and stood still. In another moment, the men leveled their muskets, fired a heavy volley, and charged into the wood. The musketry receded again, a battery went forward and added itself to the general crash, which was kept up until darkness had well set in. While we sat and watched and listened, in comparative safety, just beside the captured redoubt, Potter had been taken in the flank by the rebels charging, and had been driven back in confusion. Griffin had advanced and restored the retired line. And who rides hither so placidly? It is General Humphreys. He has stolen off, and bless his old soul, has been having a real nice time, right in the line of battle. Quote, a pretty little fight, he said gingerly. A pretty little fight. <laughs> Poor Potter. It wasn't his fault. Our extreme advance was driven back, but the day was a great success, with important strategic bearing." Unquote. Theodore Lyman's Letter From Meade's Headquarters, 1863-1865 And that's when they went off to go lay down in front of that battery of cannons that started dueling the other battery, so it must have been pretty nerve-wracking for the 155th. I really enjoy finding alternate pieces of the same incident when I'm reading these books and putting them together. Oh, it's, it's so entertaining to read. And having that regiment and the 155th getting their gear. I mean, this happens in modern times too. If you leave gear around, it's going to, someone's going to snatch it up. That's just what happens. Like I know an incident that I can remember of, and I'm not saying I know who did it, but I remember a National Guard unit coming around and asking about missing radio batteries and food and water. There was a lot of innocent looks in my infantry regiment that day. So in the military, if you abandon your stuff or if you get rid of it, it's gone. Them talking about new recruits picking up smoking or getting addicted to tobacco. That is such a true statement. I held out for an entire year in the Marines made it through after boot camp, the school of infantry, then my entire first workup and deployment. And the first cigarette I ever had was the day we got back from deployment, which was the day that President Obama was duly elected the first time. And to my cheer, I might add, and to others who were yelling racial slurs, I remember that day very clearly. They gave me a ballot on that same day, and they're like, here, you could vote. And then I watched him get elected and I just threw it in the trash. Uh, but my roommate, he gave me a cigarette to celebrate. And I was, I finally gave, I was like, fine, I'll try it and I'll see what it's about. The nicotine really messed me up. And I was like, after that, I was like, man, I got to go get my own pack. And so I was walking down the street and a military police officer stops me in his car and asks if I was okay. Because I'm wobbling all over the sidewalk. And then when I told him it was my first cigarette... He just started laughing at me and then drove off. And that was the start of my true to form, just as they say it, you know, my love affair with tobacco and all the spontaneous things that happen at smoke pits, which is the area where you can smoke on a military base. And that's it for my notes that I wrote. Uh, let's talk about some of the... Oh, man. Some of the exciting things we have coming up. First of all, surprise on the new song. You're welcome. I've been thinking about wanting to change it up for a while. And also the song that the Union soldiers themselves were various forms of it that they would sing all of the time. 
So it's going to be my new intro song. At the end of this, you'll, you'll hear the full outro. It's almost five minutes long, six minutes long. So you can listen to it all the way through. It's going to be at the end of this. Probably on Sunday, I'm going to post it up on my YouTube channel. So that way you can add it to like a YouTube playlist or something like that if you want. I worked with a Steve Waddington and he is such a great artist. Oh my goodness. I'm going to, I'm going to post for him. Uh, he has his own website. You can go check it out. He's a fantastic musical artist. Uh, so on the, on my, on the YouTube channel, there'll, there'll be a link and credit due to him. And then here on this episode on my website on rebellionstories.com, I'll also do the same. Just a oh, fantastic artist. All right. I'm still trying to figure out, okay, moving on. I'm still trying to figure out what I'm doing for an upload schedule for like the various arms of the content I'm building I'm currently living away from home. So once I am home, finally, I am taking some time to just crank out content. And I'm just, I'm really excited for that. And taking like a little break from work so I can do it. I've been working at jobs since I was 14 and that was, oh gosh, a long time ago now. So I want to take a real break to build content and to kind of build the process for like doing, getting the content going, you know, and then of course I have to go back to work. So it's not going to last forever, but one can dream. So I hope you enjoy the content of a discord, which I already have, but I haven't learned how to use properly yet. I've got the podcast, the YouTube channel, and hopefully I'll be able to get all three going and combined. And it's something like, if you're wondering like what I'm talking about, how I'm going to do this, the idea is that I'll have a podcast episode every week, a Patreon episode every two weeks, and a YouTube channel post every week or every other week. And it's going to be Civil War music, poetry, or a book chapter. And if you're on the Patreon, you'll have access to the Discord invite, and we'll do book reviews, movie watches, like just hanging out and talking and watching a film, Iron Eagle or something crazy. <laughs> what? Doesn't, won't just be Civil War stuff. <laughs> Iron Eagle's a pretty bad film, uh, which is why I chose it. All right. Uh, we'll chat and talk and play video games together and that kind of thing. Uh, maybe even board games. Like, who knows? Just want to build our own little community and just have a lot of fun for it. So, oh, last bit of news. My uniform finally came in and my shoes. It's been a really long, I'm really excited to be going on this trip and I'm not going to make it to Gettysburg, unfortunately, because of the price of gas. I live in Washington state guys. So if I'm going to go to Gettysburg, I got to fly there, drive there. And the prices of both I could do it, but do I want to do that price? Like, do I want to spend that much money driving to Gettysburg with the price of gas or flying there with the price of flights and then having to get a rental car and they are absurdly expensive right now. So I'm still going to do a trip. I'm still going to walk the same amount of miles. I'm just going to be doing it closer to where I live and Still in, oh man, it sucks. I really wanted to go guys, but I just, they can't justify spending like three grand or four grand on gasoline to go walking. Oh, even if it's for a really cool cause and to do it in a really cool way. So my goal is still to do that. I just got to wait until things settle down. I'm guessing. So, all right, my friends, it is the weekend. Uh, enjoy yourselves. I hope you guys all stay safe. Stay away from that monkey pox. My goodness, one after another, huh? And I will catch you in the next episode. My Patreon episode's going to come out a little bit later today. So that's going to go up. You're still going to be able to listen to that. That's going to be for everybody still. And then the next Patreon episode will be for Patreons uh, or for patrons only. So I think I will 
Also, sometime this week, put up a picture of me in the whole uniform with all the gear. And then, you know, we'll do it. We'll crank out the, uh, I was originally going to do 65 miles in Pennsylvania, but I think here in Washington, I'll be able to do a lot more. So we'll see. And I got to replan the route and all sorts of stuff, but I've got, you know, almost everything's in place now. So I'm really excited to be able to go do this and I'm going to record the whole thing or bits and pieces of it and put it together to show you guys. So even taking the time to like set up a half tent and just camp in it and then go hiking again and or go marching, I should say. It's not really hiking, right? All right. I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay safe. <laughs> Have a great one. Oh, and before I say goodbye, uh, go ahead and have a solid drink for Color Sergeant Thomas J. Marlin and Corporal Thomas Anderson for planting that flag on those battlements. Take a big swig and be like, here's to you boys in blue. Because that was, that was pretty cool. Old John right. Brown's Bye -bye. body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Hallelujah, for his soul is marching on. John Brown was a hero, undaunted, true, and brave. And Kansas knew his valor when he fought her rights to save. And now, though the grass grows green above his grave, his soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. For his soul. On. He captured Harper's Ferry with us, nineteen men so few, and frightened old Virginia till she trembled through and through. They hung him for a traitor, themselves a traitorous crew, but a soul. Is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. For his soul is marching. John Brown was John the Baptist of the Christ we are to see. Christ who of the bondmen shall the liberator be. And soon throughout the sunny south the slaves shall all be free. For his soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. That he heralded, he looked from heaven to view On the army of the Union With its flag red, white, and blue And heaven shall sing with anthems Or the deed they mean to do For his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah
martyrs of freedom Then strike while strike ye may The death blow of oppression in a better time and way The dawn of old John Brown has brightened in the day And his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Soul.